we're, we're entering into a period of time where I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to discern trends and, and to figure out where we are going to go in terms of the state of Nebraska, our region here in the Midwest, compared to uh, what's been happening in, in other places uh, around the world and on the East Coast. And obviously, folks have seen uh, a lot of things in the media projecting potential courses for the U.S. based on some of those trends. And, and we've discussed where um, countries, certainly with higher vaccination and boosting rates, have greater decoupling between cases and hospitalizations than those with lower vaccination rates. And the trends that we're seeing in the East Coast in an area where, uh, again, vaccination rates and boosting rates are, in general, considerably higher than they are in other parts of the country that are uh, perhaps a couple of weeks behind, uh, may mean that um, trends don't necessarily follow the way some people expect they will, but, but all of this will be borne out over the next several weeks to a couple of months uh, as data become clearer. But now we'll continue to, to look at what the trends are showing us and also a couple of recent scientific studies, I think, that, that reinforce uh, and highlight some of the things that uh, experts have been talking about for a while. So the first uh, study that I think is uh, important to point out was just published a few days ago in Nature Medicine. This was a study out of Scotland that looked at um, pregnant women and COVID vaccination and outcomes uh, of COVID infection. Uh, in Scotland, over the course of uh, almost uh, a year from early December 2020 until the end of October 2021. Uh, so you can see that uh, Scotland has a, a national health system, obviously, as part of the UK's NHS and has uh, the ability to look at all of their data across that health system. So you can see that uh, uh, over 18,000 pregnant women were vaccinated uh, for COVID-19 during that time period. Uh, however, uh, vaccine coverage for that population of pregnant women was much lower than the population than vaccination coverage in all women. And that's a trend I think that we've clearly seen in the US here as well. There's been a lot of hesitancy among pregnant women to get vaccination. Uh, and so that has led to uh, less uh, robust protection in that particular population uh, than in most others, certainly in uh, the general population of comparable age. And what this study found is if you look at um, uh, the incidence of infection uh, in the general population of women and in the population of pregnant women, you can see that there is not a huge difference in the overall uh, incidence per 100,000 in the vaccinated and unvaccinated women. Um, <clears throat> but there is also, um, I, I think, paralleling what we know about the epidemiology of the virus, a significant higher rate, significantly higher rate of infection uh, among younger women of childbearing age compared to uh, older women. And you can see in that top right panel B that uh, it is younger women uh, who are in general, again, more socially connected and active and uh, potentially uh, having higher risk uh, behaviors for contracting a respiratory virus that have higher incidence. Um, and then what you see is there's also a clear correlation with uh, you know, essentially an index of uh, vulnerability and um, that has to do with socioeconomic status. And you can see that the more vulnerable populations as we've seen in the US have higher rates of infection. Now, Panel D, the bottom right, is the most important because this then compares the incidence of SARS infection, SARS CoV 2 infection, SARS CoV 2 infection that resulted in hospital admission and then uh, winding up in the ICU uh, by vaccination status. And you can see that uh, the incidence of uh, SARS CoV 2 infection among vaccinated. Um, was still lower than what you would proportionally expect. Again, about 33% uh, of uh, pregnant women at this period were, were vaccinated. And the number who ended up with infections is uh, clearly lower than 33%. But the, the clear uh, um, significant vaccine effectiveness is in preventing hospitalization and uh, admission to the ICU. You can see there that only one out of 100 
um, infected pregnant women who ended up in the ICU were fully vaccinated and one additional was partially vaccinated. So significant protection against uh, severe infection in pregnant women given by the vaccine. And when you look at overall uh, data, both of preterm births and in peripartum mortality, so that's death within uh, 28 days uh, of, um, uh, or death for women who were diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 within 28 days of delivery, you can see that there's a, a huge statistical association of higher rates of preterm birth um, and higher rate of uh, maternal mortality. So uh, the background rate of preterm birth for this population was eight uh, per 100 uh, live births, as you see here. Um, I think it's actually supposed to be 1,000 live births. Uh, and then the, uh, oh, actually that's 100 live births, it's 1,000 for mortality, excuse me. And then the rate of preterm delivery for women who were diagnosed with uh, COVID within 28 days of birth was, you can see, uh, almost 17. And then if you look at maternal mortality, the baseline is uh, five and a half or so, 5.6 per thousand live births uh, compared to women who had um, COVID diagnosed within 28 days. Again, that's 22 and a half. So um, a huge increase of essentially four times uh, the maternal mortality for women infected within uh, one month, uh, essentially four weeks of giving birth. So this um, reinforces what we've seen with other studies that pregnant women are at increased risk uh, for worse outcomes. It does appear that pregnant women at the end of pregnancy in third trimester may be at even higher risk. And uh, we know this is true for some other infectious diseases. Uh, and you can see there are those numbers that were represented by that graphic. Uh, the vast majority of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections, uh, the overwhelming majority of hospitalizations and critical care admission were in unvaccinated uh, mothers. So reinforces uh, that message that we really need pregnant women to get vaccinated uh, to reduce their uh, overall risk. The second study I thought was worth highlighting, this came out um, a bit ago, uh, but is some of the best data we have uh, to look at vaccine effectiveness in the U.S. Um, most of the data that we have been able to, to look at that have good large studies of vaccine efficacy um, are from uh, Europe, the U.K., or Israel. These data come from the U.S. So again, I think important to, uh, to see that uh, vaccine effectiveness studies uh, in the U.S. seem to replicate what we found elsewhere. This was a study in kids uh, looking at the uh, COVID-19, overcoming COVID-19 network hospitalizations uh, in, in a very standard vaccine effectiveness uh, design, uh, looking at kids admitted and then looking at their vaccination status. And uh, bottom line is showing that for kids, again, age 12 to 18, uh, which at the time was really the only population, this was uh, right around when the vaccine for five-year-olds was uh, being approved, 93% um, vaccine effectiveness for all infection uh, or for all hospitalization of all ages. And you can see uh, really similar and, and not statistically different uh, between 12 to 15 and 16 to 18 year olds. So it shows that uh, the vaccine, at least pre-COVID for kids or I mean, pre-Omicron for kids, had very uh, high rates of vaccine effectiveness, and that replicates what we've seen in, in the adult populations elsewhere. This was a graphic the CDC came up with, which I think, again, is uh, helpful to illustrate to folks the significant protection that's afforded to kids now uh, with um, COVID-19 uh, and the vaccine. And then a second study, which just came out recently in the New England Journal, looked at vaccine effectiveness over an entire population uh, in North Carolina. Again, this is data from the US now that uh, helps to reinforce some of the data we've seen uh, from other countries, looking at the uh, 10 and a half million North Carolina residents and their vaccination rates and uh, hospitalization, and then looking at vaccine effectiveness over time to see uh, how significantly that changes. And I think the takeaways here are, a couple. First of all, uh, there appears to be very long lasting uh, immunity against uh, overall COVID-19 
infection. You can see that's that COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness. And you can see that even after eight months, uh, there was still high levels of vaccine effectiveness for all three vaccines. Uh, you can see that Moderna and Pfizer had slightly higher vaccine effectiveness uh, than did the J&J &J vaccine, but still uh, even out to eight months. And this was clearly within the window of Delta at that time. Obviously, this was all pre-Omicron. Uh, and you can also see that vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization actually persisted even eight months out. So uh, reinforces what uh, we've heard from others that it is still primarily the unvaccinated that are ending up in the hospital and ending up in the ICU. Uh, we're certainly seeing uh, among some of the, the very old over the age of 75 uh, and people with underlying comorbidities and immune compromising conditions that boosting is necessary to get good vaccine protectiveness. But for the overwhelming majority, uh, even eight months out, we're seeing significant protection against hospitalization and death. And you see that lower panel there uh, in protection against death. And I, I think also clear that uh, for death, and that's probably more pronounced in the elderly, and we'll see here, one dose of the J&J, &J, probably not sufficient for long lasting durable immunity, but that was something that uh, experts kind of came to the conclusion about um, many, many months ago, and a second dose of J&J &J has been recommended. You can see this is actually now broken down by age, and you can see that for most uh, age groups, that level of protection against um, hospitalization uh, uh, is uh, relatively similar, um, and that uh, it is really only among the folks who were um, uh, and this is actually all infection, not just hospitalization. It, it's uh, folks over the age of 65 uh, with the J&J &J vaccine that seem to have a, a significant, uh, more significant difference from the other age groups. And overall, the J&J &J vaccine, as, uh, as we noted, has slightly lower protection. But overall, again, good news that these vaccines many months out uh, retain good protection against hospitalization and death. Finally, I uh, want to look at some trends uh, among different states uh, on the East Coast um, to see how they are faring and, and uh, wanted to look specifically at Vermont and Maine. These are two states that have high vaccination rates. As we've discussed before, you can see Vermont has 78% uh, of the entire population fully vaccinated, 95%, uh, slightly higher than 95% of those 65 and up, you can see that they've seen a, a massive wave of Omicron much higher than anything they had seen uh, previously by six or seven fold. However, uh, their hospitalization rate is still um, uh, slightly lower for the uh, elderly population and only slightly higher for all comers compared to their previous peak in hospitalization. And so if you look at all ages, uh, their um, overall hospitalization rate for COVID is about 4.6 per 100,000. That's still really on the low side. And you can see that most of that has been uh, the impact of uh, people under the age of 60 uh, who have much higher hospitalization rates than they've had uh, previously. But again, overall, relatively low rates. If you look at Maine, another state which has a very high rate of vaccination, again, 77% of the population fully vaccinated, 95% of those over the age of 65. They had a pretty uh, significant and long Delta surge and now an Omicron surge, uh, which uh, seems as if it may be plateauing. And again, they have an overall relatively low rate of hospitalization uh, similar to what they saw at previous peaks, around four per 100,000 overall. And you can see for their uh, more elderly, those rates are about the same. And for uh, younger populations, they are uh, a bit higher. Uh, and that trend uh, seems to be relatively consistent. And I think this reflects those vaccination rates in large part that uh, their elderly populations are highly vaccinated. Their younger populations are certainly more vaccinated than most other states, but still less so uh, than uh, what we see in the elderly populations. Finally, looking at Nebraska, we see that we have significantly lower rates of overall vaccination, 61% uh, of the total population and about 91% of our seniors over the age of 65. So pretty good for seniors there. And, and that's helpful because that will protect against uh, probably worse outcomes in the most vulnerable populations, but uh, still a low rate among the other age groups, and, and that is going to result in higher hospitalization rates there. You can see that we haven't yet quite 
caught our, our previous peak, uh, but we're up a little higher than what those East Coast state, states were about 5.7 per 100,000 overall hospitalizations uh, and still seem to be climbing upwards. And similar to what we've seen in those other communities, uh, it's not necessarily our uh, uh, older folks over the age of 60, who again, have a relatively high rate of vaccination and for Nebraska have a, a decent rate of boosting compared to other states at least. Um, but it is driven more by some of the younger populations uh, who have higher uh, per capita hospitalization rates uh, than they've seen previously. So that's where we are. Those are the trends that uh, I think we are going to continue to see. Uh, again, important to emphasize uh, vaccine for everyone and particularly for vulnerable populations by pregnant women, uh, such as pregnant women, et cetera. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll see how those trends continue. So turn it back over to you, Shelley. <laughs> 